look at how beautiful this is showing up. This is color accurate, you guys. This colorway. Oh. Welcome to Mando Bug Crafts, episode 113. What's up, everybody? My name is Amanda, but you may know me on the internet as Mando Bug, and this is my crafty podcast where I hopefully inspire you on your making journey as I share mine. In this video, I have knitting to talk about. That's it. So, starting out with something I've learned. I've learned a lot in the last two weeks since I've talked to you guys, and it is impossible to share it all. This video would be hours and hours long. Want to know how I know? <laughs> you may have seen my IG live. So I've decided to do one IG live a month, the last Saturday of the month. I did today's at 10 a.m., but that was too early. So I think I'm going to be switching to noon for March. So for my IG live, I asked people in my stories what they wanted to hear me talk about. And I got some varying answers and uh, came upon the topic of how to choose a yarn base. Specifically, let's talk fiber content. And I didn't want to leave any fiber content out. So it took a lot more research than I anticipated, even though I'm a pretty experienced spinner, knitter, crocheter with a background in, in fiber content. I mean, I've spun most fiber contents raw. Um, there's still a lot more information that I didn't know and I found out. So the research took forever, but I learned a ton. And then my IG live was like over 30 minutes long. So I'm not going to go into the details here, although I am contemplating making a more thought out YouTube video. Um, if I redo that talk for YouTube, I want to have actual examples of each fiber content that I can visually share with you um, to make it the ultimate resource because I had to go everywhere to compile all this information. I'm very confident there is nowhere else you can go to get all of the information that I shared in my IG Live. So if you're on Instagram, I highly recommend you go to my profile and check out my IGTV. So on the home page, there's those four tabs. Go to the IGTV one that looks like a TV and I'll have one video up there. Um, it'll say, uh, how to choose a yarn base episode one. Let's talk fiber content. This is gold, you guys. I'm very confident. This is really good stuff. I put a lot of work into it. And figuring how much I know about fiber content, there's a good chance you will learn at least one new thing. Um, you just have to make it through my ums. For whatever reason, I went live and became an um machine. <laughs> I record my podcasts, but they're not live. There's like this added pressure of feeling when you're live, especially when no one's joining you. I found I was more comfortable when there were people in my live with me than when it was just me, which is weird. But anyways, I learned a lot about fiber contents. I In that video, I broke everything down by the three main categories, which are uh, natural, fibers, semi-synthetic fibers, and fully synthetic fibers. And then I'll share the most surprising thing from my research, which was that bamboo is not in the natural fibers category under plant-based fibers. The plant-based fibers that I talked about were cotton, linen, and hemp. I learned that it is not possible to make yarn with bamboo naturally. The fibers are only three millimeters long, which means it has to undergo a very intense chemical process that uses several harsh chemicals. Um, the process is known as viscose, which puts that into a rayon category. And so if you go look up on Ravelry, go search for a yarn that's bamboo, and you'll see even Ravelry lists that yarn contents as rayon from bamboo. Or even in some yarns, you'll see viscose from bamboo. Sometimes viscose and rayon are used interchangeably, although viscose is not the only process that can be used to create a rayon fiber. There's also lyocell. The lyocell process is used in the patented name tencel, which hand spinners are probably more familiar with than regular knitters and crocheters. There is tencel yarn though, but it shows up a lot in fiber blends for spinning. So it's another 
um, rayon is chemically treated cellulose fibers and cellulose fibers can be anything from wood derived or plant derived like bamboo so I don't want to I don't want to go too much into it go check out my live on my Instagram account it's saved under my IGTV you just got to work through the ums I'm sorry about that in advance <laughs> oh but one thing I did want to talk about on here specifically because I didn't get into super detail in my live was that I firsthand learned the difference between superwash and non superwash yarns um, <laughs> I'm pausing because I I want to share the information, but I also have to be careful um, what I share because it's for a secret design. So let's just say that I learned that superwash yarn, generally, if you take the same base uh, of wool and you make it into the same weight, I'm talking weight per yardage, um, wraps per inch are going to be different based on the weight of superwash treated wool versus non superwash treated wool because superwash treated wool goes through a chemically harsh process where chlorine eats, burns off the outer scales of the wool and then a polymer based resin coating is put on the outside of the wool. It is a plastic coating and that coating is a little bit heavier and it makes the yarn smoother. So there is a huge difference between superwash yarn and non-superwash yarn and how they behave. And making a swatch in non-superwash and then superwash, I found that for this particular yarn that I was using that I had to go down a needle size considerably in order to get a fabric that was not too open and airy because it is a thinner yarn. And then also because of that super wash treatment, it doesn't hold its shape as well because that, that natural characteristic that the yarn is taken away and it grows and it stretches. And so those two things, um, I, I can't really talk about it too much, but those were some things that I learned about superwash wool versus non-superwash wool. There is a huge difference. You can't just substitute the two in a design. It's going to completely change your pattern <laughs> and your yardage required, right? Because the yarn is thinner, I had to go down in hook size and that meant a denser gauge. The fabric is still drapey, although it is heavier. It's heavier by volume. So um, the overall object will be heavier and will require more yarn than the original that was using just natural wool. The superwash allows the finished item to be an easier care, more hard wearing object, but there are trade-offs. Um, oh, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about as far as something I learned was, oh my gosh, you guys, moth control. So I don't think that I had a wool moth. There's a variety of moths, but I opened my closet and a moth flew out. And as any yarn owner will do, I was freaking out. Um, I killed it immediately and uh, then I, I have my like finished woolen items on the top shelf in my closet, my sweaters, my shawls, and that's kind of where it flew out of. So I immediately inspected all of the wool on that shelf and I saw no signs of damage and I saw no casings. Everything was fine, but to be safe, I took all all of the woolens from my closet and put them in plastic bags and put them in the freezer and then I started talking to some friends who were like did you know that you actually have to go through two freezing sessions to be truly safe and this has to do with the fact that if there's eggs and they're frozen they can dethaw and still hatch so you have to freeze to kill anything alive you have to let it kind of warm up and then you have to refreeze to catch anything that came back alive. So thankfully I have a deep freezer and that hasn't been an issue. This is probably just being overly cautious, but yeah, I freaked out. Um, and I didn't know that you have to do a double freeze. Um, I knew that freezing was one of the best options. Um, you can freeze and or heat and I don't want to have to cook my sweaters. So freezing was the best option for me. Um, yeah, so that is what I've learned this week or some of what I've learned this week. 
Um, I don't have any finished objects because I've been primarily working on my magazine design. So, uh, and I've been mostly monogamous on that. So I just have two, fin uh, two works in progress to share with you this week. So I knit a couple more rows on my two ways to crow, no, two ways to knit it right shawl. Um, I'm still working on, I'm still running the two ways to crochet it right test. So the crochet version of this shawl, it ends in a couple days and then the pattern will be fully released on March 2nd. So probably a little before or about the time you see this video, the pattern will be live. Um, I don't currently have any promotions for it. Um, so it, it, it'll be a $6 pattern available on Ravelry or Etsy. I'm working on my website eventually so that I can get that as another option for pattern purchasing if you'd like um, more Ravelry alternatives, but we're not there yet. Websites is whole other beast of an issue <laughs> where I'm also learning a lot, but I feel like that's less appropriate to talk about on here. Unless you want me to do a separate video, leave me a comment. I will consider it. Two ways to knit it right. A couple more rows. I realize I keep showing this shawl to you guys backwards so you keep seeing the wrong side. It does have a beautiful transition between the stripes um, on the right side. So I think I have, I'm working on this white stripe and then I have one more purple stripe to go before I get to start the border. I love the way the knit version's turning out. It does have a stretchier quality to it and it is a little bit thinner as, as far as thickness goes, but it's all the same beauty. And it's, I'm surprised how easy it is for me to design, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like knit and crochet versions of the same pattern. Like I'm kind of blowing my own mind here, um, especially cause like the bird foot hat, which is my other work in progress, I'll show you. I think I found a way to crochet that. And I know that I have, um, people who enjoy my patterns who only knit and also only crochet. So crocheters see the knit pattern and go, hey, I want to make that, but I don't want to learn how to knit. So <laughs> uh, that might be around the corner, but I'm going to have to move my schedule around to do it. Two ways to knit it right. This is using Teal Torch Knits yarn that I got at a trunk show back when I worked at Maker's Mercantile. She is an indie dyer from Portland, Oregon. And I'm using the A Sunday Kind of Love colorway and the Sinking My Sinking In My Soul colorway. These are both on her TTK sock, which is a 7525 Superwash Merino wool and nylon blend. And I love the way that it, they're knitting up. You may have seen them in the last couple of episodes. Um, I love the way they work together. Uh, they're beautiful. I originally bought these as a trio, actually. Um, there was a third color that kind of matches the red tones in this one. And originally I thought that I would design some sort of a faded item, but when it came time to knit this shawl, I was looking to use up stash yarn and these two colors were the right combo. You want a high contrasting combo for this pattern to look the best. Um, which reminds me my um, testers are almost done. So here is a parade of their finished or almost finished shawls for the crochet version. So I really love all the colors that they chose and you can see that the higher contrasts look the best. Um, oh, and then you may notice I've got little hearts on the end of my project here. So I'm knitting using the Addy Click Set and they have these heart stoppers that you can get and click into the end of your work when you want to take the needles. I'm knitting this on a US size 5 needle. I'm also knitting my bird foot hat on a US size 5 needle. So I had to steal it to knit that, which is my other work in progress. And you can tell this is my favorite fabric from, from Fate's Thread. My two active projects are in this fabric. <laughs> uh, the other 
work in pro oh look at how beautiful this is showing up this is color accurate you guys this colorway oh I love it so much and I'm not even a green person and I totally didn't realize St. Patrick's Day is coming up and some people reach out to me and be like oh yeah St. Patrick's Day oh yeah I guess <laughs> um this is for my son Jack. So the bird foot hat pattern I showed you I finished last week. We went out and photographed it in the snow and I graded it for sizes baby to adult extra large. And I, oh man, I put out a call for testers and nobody signed up in the first day and I got really sad. And then my amazing friends shared it and I got enough people signed up to test it. And um, basically everybody got their size of choice but that left out the child size but Jack wants one anyways and he's five years old so the child size should fit in theory except my sizes for my patterns are based off of the craft yarn council's suggested size standards and according to their standards Jack's head circumference is the same size as an adult small but this pattern is a ribbed pattern and it stretches tremendously. So the design has five and a half to six inches of negative ease, which means he might be okay in the child size. So I went ahead and I cast on and I tried it on. It's a little snug, but it sure does fit. And the crown to the base of the ear measurement is going to be better for the child size than the adult small size, which by the way, that's a pattern hack. If you have a hat that you want to custom fit, you can swap out areas of the pattern where you take the cast on number for the adult small, but follow the repeat number for the child size. Pattern hack. Um, but this really only works if it's a well-written pattern. I'm talking like schematic and finished measurements are ways that you can check that that's really going to work for you. Um, Maybe I'll do another video on that because I feel like that's really a really helpful fit pattern hack and I could really go into detail about that. Um, anyways, I'm all over the place today. This yarn, right? Whose yarn is it, you guys, right? This is Schmutzarella Yarns and this is um, one of her newer colorways. I don't even know if it's available yet because I did become a patron of hers and she, her patron support tiers is pretty awesome. You get access to a Zoom and a, a free shipping, depending on your tier, you can get free shipping and um, permanent discount to her website, as well as early access to new colorways. And this is, this is this. So she has a collection that is the Time Warp collection, which I like to describe as a black stained rainbow. It's a really beautiful collection. This is the not black stained version of the Time Warp collection. Um, and this green is called, I know, so much reflection. Uh, Madness takes its toll and I got it on Groovy, which is her DK weight yarn. It's 100% superwash merino. Now the original bird foot pattern was using Mesa Skein's Spay DK, which I believe is a 7525 superwash nylon DK base. So I'm going to get a different gauge. I'm going to get a different product um, based on the fiber contents, but it's going to be super close. So I didn't even bother to gauge swatch because the original pattern is based on my gauge. So it's going to be close enough. Um, and I've only just cast on and knit the first couple rows. I haven't even picked up my loose strands yet. But um, one thing that Nancy said to me when I ordered this yarn was, you are going to be lovingly surprised by the way that this dye color breaks in the yarn. And she was absolutely right. Part of what makes this electric green color beautiful is the way that it breaks and it's not a full solid. It's just a gorgeous semi-solid. Semi-solid enough that it's interesting but doesn't distract from the overall stitch definition and stitch pattern. So I'm really excited. Jack absolutely loves the color. I love the color and I'm not one for super bright colors unless it's orange really. So I'm very excited about the bird foot hat and finishing that up for Jack. And I do believe this is super wash. So when it um, 
blocks it should stretch a little even more to have a little bit looser fit for Jack's head and since he's already at 19 inches in circumference hopefully his head isn't growing all that much more in the next couple years and we can get some use out of this <laughs> if not it'll be handed down in time to Annie actually Emily too because I think her Jack's is 19 inches and I think Emily's head circumference is 18 and she's a year older she just has a small Jack's got a big tater <laughs> Um, yeah, and so like I said, the only other work in progress I have, I can't share, it's my magazine design, and it is a, it is a pretty large design, not super time consuming. That's one thing I've been working on. Oh, I'll talk about that in Let's Chat. I, hopefully I won't forget, because I didn't write it down. Oh, but it is Let's Chat. So actually, moving on to Let's Chat, before I talk about what I wrote down, last episode I talked about working on, um the <laughs> my my hyper focusing I talked about how I tend to hyper focus and I struggle to take breaks or leave projects unfinished um, or in a good stopping place and I came across the Pomodoro technique I still have yet to actually implement the timing of that technique but what I have implemented instead is finding out how long something's going to take me to finish before I really start working on it so that I can plan it out appropriately. So what that means for my knitting and crochet projects and or designs is a spreadsheet that has all of the stitches in the pattern and then my speed. So I work on the pattern a little bit and I time myself at a comfortable speed. I'm not racing the clock because that's not how I knit or crochet. I'm just sitting there comfortably knitting or crocheting um, somewhere within the span of a minute to a couple minutes. And I get my ratio of stitches per minute. And then I use that spreadsheet of how many stitches are in the pattern to figure out how long it's gonna take me to make the entire pattern. The great thing about this template is you have all the stitches, so you can also divide by total stitches to, cause like, it'll be like row one is this many stitches and you can just build your template that way. And if you have a running total on the side, you can divide your stitch count by the total and you'll get your percentage of the way through your project. So especially with those sneaky shawls um, that get longer and longer and longer in row stitches, um, you can see that, oh yeah, I've knit this much of my shawl, but I'm only not even 20% done. And you can see that sometimes like the last 10 rounds of a shawl is 25% of the shawl's knitting. Uh, so that's been really helpful when it comes to really fully understanding how long it's gonna take me to make something, which is important when it comes to planning and timing, which is important with pattern release, deadlines, and timelines. So that has been the most helpful thing for me overall. Um, so yeah, I wanted to mention that everything is baby steps, so I'm not super concerned about the 25 minute break thing. Um, I want to take one baby step at a time so that I don't overwhelm myself with too much change at once because that's not super sustainable. Um, and so then the other thing that I wanted to chat about is I turned 32. So I had my birthday back on February 20th and I am now... 32 years old and it feels good. I posted about it on Instagram. Um, I remember when I was in my 20s, I was kind of like scared of my 30s. Like that's like a, that's like a step, right? Like we put these milestones on the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. And I was like looking at myself and where I was and where I thought I'd be. And, um, I wasn't super happy approaching 30 and so in these last couple of years I've made some major life changes that have been very scary but also very necessary. I've done a lot of self-help reading as you guys know from my podcasts a couple years ago when this started, um, this thought process started. Um, I've worked through past trauma, I've worked through ways that I self-sabotage myself, I worked on why the heck I was so insecure and had severe imposter syndrome. like. It's just been a lot of internal work with amazing benefits. I am in such a better place now and I feel good. 
and my 30s feel good. They're like, they have been the best years of my life. I love where I am. And with that, things get a little scary because then you don't want it to end, right? No, I don't. No, I don't. But I'm grateful to be where I am and I'm very happy and I had a great birthday. Um, yeah, it, it, so I was sick on my birthday and so um, it was a very isolated birthday and everybody that knows me well knows that my one of my top love languages is food. So I had several people deliver food to my porch on my birthday. I had burritos. I had uh, prime rib. I had smoked ribs. I had chocolate cake. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Oh, speaking of all that food, <laughs> um, I've also been getting back into the swing of um, a nice schedule to be mindful and exercise. So a fun thing to do when you're looking to make habits and changes in your life is to start and then don't break don't break the uh, chain. So I am on a six day streak, don't break the streak, streak of uh, daily exercise of 30 minutes and daily meditation of 10 minutes and it is amazing. I don't care how much food I eat, when I exercise daily, my energy levels are through the roof and that has been amazing and so necessary as a mother to three children. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, I could go on and on, you guys, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below, and I will see you in two weeks. Until then, happy crafting. Bye!